So when thinking about competition concerns in AI today, there's a number of concepts that have actually come up over and over again in competition policy over the last decades. Um, one is scale economies. That's just bigger is better. Um, scale economies can arise because there's fixed costs, and you know the, the more you make, the lower your average cost, and you need to overcome those fixed costs to enter. Um, it can also be learning by doing, either on the cost side or the quality side. Um, and generally, scale economies can be a barrier to entry and thus important for competition. Um, network effects are a special type of scale economy that occur when you know the more people that use a product, the better it is for any individual using it, so like communication networks. Network effects can also be um, indirect, where in a marketplace or a platform, buyers want sellers, and more sellers want more buyers. So those types of network effects um, also come up a lot in technology products and in software products. Now. All of those things can matter um, when we think about um, competition and how it works. So in a standard textbook model of competition, uh, firms ha can only do one thing, that is set their price. Maybe they can do two things. They can change their quality too. Um, and so if you know firms start getting sloppy, their quality goes down, price goes too high, what we expect is that other firms will come in and enter to take those profits and steal customers from the existing firms. But if there are barriers to entry, scale economies or network effects being examples, then a firm can raise price and maybe another firm doesn't come in and enter. There's no discipline. And if you have a small number of firms, they start getting soft with one another. They all realize, well, if all of our prices stay high, we stay out of each other's way, stay out of each other's territory. Um, we, may, uh, we don't have to really worry about anyone else coming in to, to discipline us. And so in the, in the modern world of technology products, all of those concepts apply. Um, but we, we see these different tactics come up that it really elucidates the limitations of the simplest model. Because an incumbent firm doesn't just have price as a choice. They might be able to do something that makes it hard for their customers to switch. So that's not good for customers. What customer ever said, make it hard for me to switch? That's not a benefit. That's not something that you that a firm does to make their customers happy. It's something that helps their profits and often hurts their customers. But it might be just a, a small annoyance for existing customers. What, who's, what's really hurt is the future of competition and the future customers who lose out on the benefits that competition might bring. Generally, when we talk about a stack in an industry, you get the idea of building blocks stacked on top of one another. So in the AI industry, if you tried to think about it from top to bottom, um, you might think about at the bottom being like chips and hardware, the compute. Um, layered on top of that is software. Um, as if, if a company is building a foundation model, a large language model, for example, um, they would use those chips and that software and also data as inputs uh, to the training. And energy uh, would be other, other elements. Um, if we think about the industry more broadly, beyond the, the sort of basic foundation models, which are basically in today the ones you're most familiar with their language, where they're trying to kind of embody knowledge and understanding of human language in a general purpose model, then people would, might build applications on top of that. OK, what do you need to do to build an application? Well, you need to either have access to a, a model, like a closed model through an API, and you need to have a, that, that needs to be available on some kind of computing service for you to access. Um, you might also need, uh, another alternative would be an open model, uh, an open weight model, where what you can do is download the weights together with um, some openly available software that allows you to, uh, to kind of find what's called fine tune or you, in other ways adapt it for your purposes as, a, as an application developer. Now the application developer also needs compute. Um, not as much compute as what's needed to train the foundation models, they, um, but they also need compute to, to adapt the model if they choose. And finally, if they set up a service for their customers to use, or a service that's provided internally, if it's, it might be an internal-facing application, then they also need uh, hardware 
to uh, store their data, that any data that's accessed, and they need uh, hardware that will allow them to make function calls to that application. So if somebody wants to use the application, like if it's a chatbot, they might ask a question and get an answer. And that takes compute and, indus and, 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 um, and energy. So, but much, much less. And it's something that we see, you know, um, you know students or, or small developers are able to do that and afford to do those types of things if they're at small scale. So, so many pieces. Um, so many elements, and so it's difficult to describe all of these and all their interrelationships, but AI stack is a shorthand for, for thinking about all of these different pieces of the puzzle. Well, so the purpose of the conference that we held today was for us to learn and, and really to educate everyone about these issues, because there's some things you can read about in research papers and in the industry press, but there's nothing like speaking to the people who are investing in it, building it, creating it in all different layers, and hearing about their concerns to get a better sense of what's really going on. So I, I don't personally uh, want to say that I know um, what the concerns are, but I think it might be helpful to summarize some themes that we heard in the conference today and different issues that were raised by different panelists that could conceivably uh, be concerns. So you know, starting at the bottom of the stack, um, there has been a widely reported uh, shortage of, of chips, and specifically the AI chips are more specialized. And so it's been very difficult for firms, both big and small firms, to get access to those chips. And so there was a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, you know, I think in any industry, if one firm controls access to a critical input and has some discretion about how it's allocated, um, everyone's a little nervous about that. Um, and they might be fearful not just about what they say, but also about, you know, what happens if they work with other other alternatives and so on um, that can that they what if what happens if they don't get access to what they need anymore so that was that was something that came up in in most panels and uh, seemed to be an area of, of concern for for folks um, we also heard about firms that were trying to enter the space and and you know how that might help alleviate some of the shortage certainly if you are if a firm has monopoly power then you know they they're not that anxious to expand capacity uh, because you know with a lower capacity they can still sell but they sell at a high price. But if there's competition, um, then you know the competitive forces can lead them to expand capacity because they would rather people buy from them than their competitor, especially in a scale-driven industry. So it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see how those competitive dynamics play out. Um, we also heard firms having concern not just about getting chips. Some firms don't buy chips directly, but they buy computing. And uh, some of the panelists talked about how in some countries there weren't a lot of choices about um, you know, what computing systems they could use if they also wanted to get access to leading large language models. And other panelists also talked about how useful it can be to let for themselves and for B2B companies, so there's some companies that make applications for business customers, that the application developers understand that, that the business customers of the application developer want to mix and match and might already have investments in one, one computing platform or another, and, and, or other, some software. And so it can be very limiting if an application developer is trying to serve business customers and they can't actually meet the customers where they are and enable their customers to have choice. So that was a concern that was raised as well. And other panelists talked about how innovation you know, can, be, uh, can be encouraged if even if a company makes products at, at multiple levels of a stack, um, if customers are free to choose across the levels of the stack, that provides incentives for companies to make great products at every level of the stack. While on the other hand, if, if a company can condition the um, availability of one key product on purchasing other products, well, those other products may not need to be quite as good for them to sell, and that can reduce their incentives to provide the best quality um, at every layer. So those were some, some issues that people raised at the, you know, the, um, the computing and LLM uh, layer. 
Finally, you know, something that, that was hinted at today, um, especially in some of the, we had a panel on healthcare applications, uh, that, you know, access to data and proprietary data can be important, not just for people building models that try to understand the English language or any language, but also models that might try to do something more specialized, like understand health or, or um, health records um, or understand the relationship between taking drugs and health outcomes, um, thing, applications that might help you make better personalized medical decisions. But it was pointed out that certain types of data are, is siloed. Um, firms might have to go through some dominant players in order to get access to data. Um, they might not be able to do so, and that could hurt innovation. So in that, there were some uh, solutions discussed about, you know, from the, the policymakers could do to make data more interoperable, to give patients more control over their data. Patients do have some control over their data in some cases. But I think it's a it's a good example that, you know, today the 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 large language models are mostly trained on public data, but as we move to more specialized models, there could be um, different types of competition concerns arising either because a firm has some proprietary data or they have data about users interacting with a certain system. They might see doctors interacting with a health AI and that data might actually help them make a better AI. And if other people don't have access to the data, it might be hard for them to come in. So I think, you know, putting all this together, um, all of these are themes we've seen in the, in technology uh, uh, competition over the last decades. It's not new. Uh, and so it was very interesting today to hear what panelists highlighted um, as applications of these kinds of, of typical conduct and behavior that we might worry about to this new AI space. I think what's maybe another theme that cross-cut everything is that people, everyone agrees this is really important. This is important for national security and national competitiveness. It's important for labor. It's important for news. It's important for our democracy. It's important for productivity. Um, you know, it's important for, for our health, for our students. So. Um, so, you know, getting this right is incredibly important. And so there's that, I think that's one reason we had hundreds of people here trying to really learn about it. Since it's hard to read about it all in the newspaper, um, there, it, I think people were, and cl including myself, really welcome the opportunity to learn um, from these expert participants, which, you know, spanned investors, VCs, um, academics, entrepreneurs, you know, small entrepreneurs, big companies, you know, big B2B companies, big application developers, chip makers, um, authors, you know, all giving their perspective to help us learn. So especially in situations where there's come some kind of scale economy or network effect, um, entry can be pretty difficult because, say, an incumbent has like all the users are using its system or all the users are using its software and then those users make complementary investments and get kind of locked in to to that system and then someone new comes along but it doesn't have the users it doesn't have the data it doesn't have the learning by doing um and therefore and so it's very hard for it to get traction um a customer of course customers realize they do better with two suppliers than one. Um, customers don't like to have to deal with monopolists, but no individual customer you know, is willing to sacrifice in order to make sure that there is competition. It's sort of a collective good. Um, so when, but in, things like interoperability can, can really lower barriers to entry because a, a firm can come in, it can, it can specialize in a niche, it can do something better, and you know, it can start to build up its scale economies and network effects little by little, and its customers don't have to just dump the old guy to use the new guy, they can use both at the same time. Um, or if, you know, if it's like a marketplace, then you, know, you, can, you might be able to, um, to switch back and forth, and if you can't find what you need on the new entrant, then you can still you know, use the, the old firm so the customers don't have to necessarily choose. And it can be very easy for, for people to, to make them, their services available on multiple platforms. And so then we, we don't have to choose between competition and this, the, the benefits of network effects. So there is, you know, these are themes that have, again, come up again and again over the last decades of competition policy. Um, and, you know, here, interoperability could, again, help. There's a lot of, of, of software that gets built. And, say, if someone uh, can't get one kind of chip and they want to bring in some other chips, it's helpful if the software interoperates well um, with, you know, multiple 
chips, and that makes it easier for them to to dual source and you know have um, all the benefits that that can can bring. Um, similarly, you know if if something is very valuable or very important as an input, and it's only available when it's bundled together with some other product, well, that's a, a form of, of lack of interoperability. It's a, a lack of, it's a exclusivity, and that can create barriers to entry. And again, it can also reduce the incentive of a firm to create the best deal in, in both kinds of products. So I think these issues have come up today. Another issue that I haven't spoken about yet is that other panelists today talked about what a challenging problem it is to actually understand what's going to make AI safe, what its risks are. It's The AI today is so general purpose that no one team or one company can possibly think of all of the things that could go wrong. We really need a, sort of a society-level response, a society-level engagement in evaluating models. And so the another element of sort of interoperability and standards is that if we have enough openness that academics can work on that, can do the research, can do some of the R&D that's really in the public's interest, you know, the academics are can be very motivated to, to uncover problems, and they can look at the problems from all sorts of different angles. They can tackle problems that might be PR risks for major firms. You know, the, you can have lots of different perspectives on, on safety, even things that people might be afraid to do. Um, for, for risk of blowback. And so the the kind of um, openness could, some panelists argued, could help create um, standards that are not just coming out of companies, but that are also coming out of the broader community and might better reflect um, societal objectives. So we've always had economists in, or not always, but for mi for many, many decades, we've had economists in, um, in, in in competition authorities around the world. Something that's new is having you know pure data science teams and technologists. And I'm very proud that at the DOJ Antitrust Division, I built the first data science team and and brought them into our team to work alongside statisticians and economists. Um, and we're also in the process of building a technology team as well. So. Those folks, the technologists and the data scientists, um, are incredibly useful because they understand the technology more deeply. They might speak a language more similar to the companies that you're trying to understand and the technologies that they're building. Um, sometimes they're users themselves, or they can help uh, government agencies adopt new technologies, and that creates familiarity and understanding, understanding of what barriers are, um, and understanding of how a customer thinks. So they become market participants, they become customers. And you know, data scientists are, can be key to doing that. Economists play many roles. One I might like to emphasize here is, again, the sort of the pattern recognition, the frameworks. Sometimes it can seem, if you get too granular, that Every new thing is different. It's, you can think about there's so many dimensions of how it's different than what came before. But economists are, are usually good at trying to see the pattern, see the framework, and think about how broader principles apply. And then when you can connect what the problems today to the problems of yesterday, you can learn from the past. You can you can see patterns. You can think about conduct. It's it's it, you can more easily understand the incentives firms have and understand the perspectives they might be thinking from. So I I think that that economic framing is very important. Of course, measurement is always important, and that's something that you know in any kind of investigation, there's a lot of quantitative measurement. Uh, but at this stage, I think that, that just being able to frame the issues so that you can organize facts and and have a more intelligent conversation about what's going on um, is, a, is a contribution that economists can make. 